Okay. Welcome, guys, to week five. Okay, does someone want to explain this question? His question was this? I think, I think this ashes. Is a, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, just give me a second. Um, so basically there's the three sort of um, levels. There's primary, secondary, and um, tertiary. Primary is what would be um, the red option, which would be um, to prevent the disease from occurring in the first place. Um, secondary is when the patient's already got it. Um, and it's, uh, it's a mixture of pharmaco pharmacological and also changing sort of your lifestyle. And then tertiary is more, um, the um, the yellow and the blue combined is tertiary. So it would be um, when the patient has it, there isn't really much else we can do. And it's more sort of just to ensure that the life that they are leave, leading isn't full of suffering and pain. Okay, thank you, Ashwini. Next question. That was pretty good. Um, so we'll just move on. Yep, perfect. So just it's not to replace com uh, conventional medicine. Yep, so 72% it was kind of a mean question, but they are kind of mean. Sometimes they do ask for statistics and stuff. Um, next question. Um, yep, so there's five main functions of epithelium and uh, movement is not one of them.
So microvilli are found on the apical surface because that's the one that's facing the lumen. Uh, on the basal surface is where the epithelium would get its blood supply. Um, lateral surface is where you have the attachments between cells and the medial surface doesn't exist. So um, for the red one, that's going to be zonular occludence that prevents substances from moving between cells. Um, the attachment point for the cytoskeleton is zonular adherence, and um, it's the macula adherence uh, and the zonular adherence that both um, glue cells together. All right, yeah, um, I think this one should be actually quite obvious. So like social factors are the factors that like are about, so like not this person, but like the environment around the person. So things like poverty, um, their family relationships, um, like their access to care, um, that would be kind of considered as social factors. And like, um, so stress is considered a um, psychological factor because um, it's like psychological stress, right? <laughs> Hopefully you guys will remember this one from last week. Good job, so two people got it right. Um, so you might remember me going through the PCR process, also known as polymerase chain reaction, which is how you kind of copy DNA. And the um, yes, it's correct that condensation is not one of the steps. So it starts by, you start by denaturing the DNA, then you anneal it, and then you have the extension. So condensation is just something I made up. It's not part of it at all. Yeah. Nice job, funky music. Yeah, good job. And that's the end of our cahoot. So welcome everyone to week five. Um, yeah, so starting off, um, I'll be going through bones and cartilage. And Savannah, do you want to explain about uh, this? Yes, so the Easter egg thing. Um, so I have inserted an Easter egg into, I think, all like presumably all of the topics, at least one of the slides in each of the topics, but this week, since Easter is coming up. So for those of you watching this on YouTube, just try and find the Easter egg in each topic. Okay, so starting off, um, so there's four basic primary tissue types. So you have epithelial tissue, um, which was covered last week. There's connective tissue, muscle, and nervous tissue. Um, yeah, so basically um, we're focusing on um, bones and cartilage today. So with connective tissue, you have specialized cells um, and the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix has ground substance and fibers. Um, and there are four main specialized cells or around, yep, four main, three main specialized cells that make up um, 
so first one is in cartilage, you have chondrocytes. In bone, they're called osteocytes. And in fat, you have adipocytes. Um, so you can see the photos next to them, or what they look like. Um, you can differentiate them very easily because they look very different. And that's very important as well. Um, within the extracellular matrix, um, you have the ground substance. So this has a lot of the nutrients and helps the passage and exchange of molecules. And it also provides a lot of mechanical support. Um, these, are the, um, these are the contents inside the ground substance. So you have proteoglycans, glycoproteins, um, and a few other, including um, water and elect electrolytes as well. Um, yeah, and that largely determines the mechanical and physical properties of the connective tissue. And um, inside the extracellular matrix, you also have fibers. Um, so these help resist deformation and stretching, and they also provide strength. Um, so there's two main ones, there's um, collagen and elastic, and we'll come to that a bit more later. Yeah, all right, so extracell extracellular matrix fibers, I'll just say ECM from now on. Um, but basically, first of all, you have collagen. So that's the most abundant type um, and it's made by fibroblasts. So just some common features and um, a few photos on the side as well to help you differentiate. So collagen has high tensile strength and um, it's important to remember that this is because of its superhelix structure. It's flexible, but it's inelastic. Um, and there's two main types, there's regular and irregular. And as you can, as you can guess, um, the name suggests that regular, the fibers are parallel um, aligned to each other. Uh, whereas irregular, it's, it's a bit all over the place, as you can also see on the image on the right. Um, irregular is a bit um, all over the place, whereas regular is very consistent lines. Um, and regular has maximum tensile strength. And the, one of the main differences is that regular um, collagen fibers, you have um, resistance to stretching in one direction, whereas in irregular, you have resistance to stretch, stretching in multiple directions. Um, then you also have elastic fibers. So they bounce back, um, as you can imagine, a rubber band. Um, it comes back to its normal shape. They're very resilient and they're made from elastin microfibrils. So you can commonly see them in an artery because, you know, with that blood flowing through, um, you need to um, constantly extend and contract um, the artery. So having an elastic fiber is very helpful there. And then lastly, you have reticular fibers. So they are type three collagen fibers and they are a delicate mesh that supports cells and they can be seen commonly um, in liver, lymphoid organs and bone marrow. All right, so the types of connective tissue <clears throat> um, so there's four main types. So there's loose, dense, regular, dense, irregular, and specialized. So specialized, firstly, um, is just blood. So it's not really in any of the, of the other categories. So it's a specialized type. Um, whereas, so you have loose connected tissue. Um, where do you find it? You find it in between cells, um, packing in between cells and other tissues. So often under the epithelium cells of trachea and small intestine. It's made of abundant ground substance. So um, I've put that in red because it's very important to know. So compared to um, regular connective tissue, um, it has much more ground substance and it's a loosely packed fiber. Dense regular is common found in tendons and ligaments. Um, there, there's few specialized cells and less ground substance, um, but it has high tensile strength and um, you have parallel regular fibers. Um, and then dense irregular, it's often found in the dermis of the skin and also organ capsules. Um, there's less ground substance, few specialized cells again, and um, yeah, so because it's woven into many different directions, the fibers, um, this is very strong in all directions. All right, so types of cartilage. Um, so you have highline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and one more I'll come to. Um, so highline cartilage, um, it's important to know the images here. So um, it's rich in collagen, proteoglycan, and chondrocytes. Um, it's very strong, flexible, and it can resist compression. Um, so where do we find it? So it's, we can find it in the articular surface of joints, costal cartilages, um, so that's where um, you're at the tip of your ribs here, when it, uh, at where it joins at the center, the respiratory cartilage and epiphyseal um, growth plates. It's most abundant. Elastic cartilage, so you have elastic fibers, and as you can guess, and it's rich in co collagen, proteoglycan, and chondrocytes again, um, and it also have, has a lot of ECM. 
um, character characteristics. So compared to highline cartilage, it's much more flexible, much more elastic. Um, and where do we see this? We see this in the external ear, epiglottis and auditory tubes. Um, so th there's just images of how it looks like. Um, it's good to know. And the third type is fibrocartilage. Um, so that's basically made of collagen fibers in the ECM. And there's a lot of fibers in there. Um, and it has high tensile strength. And where do we find it? So we can find it in the annulus fibrosis. So it's in between your vertebral discs on your spine. Um, also in the meniscus, so in your knee, um, that's in your knee joint, and um, symphysis pubis. Um, and that's a basic image of the cartilage. And in the diagram, you can see that the white there um, is basically the cytoplasm of the cells. The dark purple is the nucleus in the center. And the purple everywhere else is just the ECM, so the extracellular matrix. Alrighty, types of bone. So you have the compact bone and the trabecular bone. So this should be easy to identify in the image below. So trabecular is more spongy. Sorry, no, no. yeah, trabecular is more spongy um, and compact is on the sides. Um, yeah, so uh, with compact bone, um, you have the ECM arranged into concentric lamellae. So as you can see on the image on the side, and the, the, the lamellae, they are organized into osteons or haversion systems. So you can see the osteons there. Um, and there's a lot of vessels and veins that run through them. Um, these bring the nutrients to all the cells in um, a compact bond, bond and also the neurovascular supply. Um, so characteristic is that it's very dense, solid and heavy compared to the trabecular bone, which is very open and honeycomb-like. Um, and yeah, you can see some images on the side as well. So with the trabecular bone, um, um, it's, in, it's dense in areas that experience more stress um, and the cells are already in contact with the hemopoietic tissue. They already access the nutrients um, and participate in gas exchange, so they don't need, the os uh, need osteons. Um, yeah, and they support um, hem hematopoietic cells around the bone um, and they're also found in the edges of blood points. So hi guys, um, I'm back with Another presentation, this time on mom. So no, I'm not talking about your female parent. I'm talking about, of course, medicine of the mind, which is your new parent. So um, learning theory, health and illness, find the Easter egg in one of my slides. So honestly, there's not much to do. Instead of having the memes, I just decided to, you know, make a colorful background for no apparent reason. And the learning theories that will be covered are classical conditioning and operant conditioning and pretty much all you need to know. So classical conditioning, also known as Pavlovian response. I did do fancy font because, you know, classical, I just thought it would be very fitting. Um, the point of classical conditioning is that you learn before you have a response. So you need like a conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus pair. So if you know anything about the Pavlovian experiment from a long time ago, um, basically it's like they, Pavlov um, triggered some dogs to salivate at the sound of bell by presenting food and at the same time ringing a bell. So that every time, then after that, whenever you rang the bell, the dogs would think that the food was coming. So that was kind of how he linked the dog's response to a very random stimulus, which is the bell, through a common stimulus of the food. So, yes, an involuntary response of the salivation was elicited by. A stimulus, um, which was the unconditioned stimulus was the food and conditioned stimulus would have been the bell. And by the way, the Easter egg is here. Oh wait, maybe I have to untie that. The Easter egg is here, it in there. And that's, that's actually the real reason why I chose this background. And operant conditioning is the other type of conditioning. So it's kind of the opposite of classical conditioning, you learn after the response. So it's kind of like a consequence, consequential thing. So you do the wrong thing, you get punished, you don't do it again, that kind of thing. So that's like negative punishment. Um, response is submitted after exposure to stimulus and there's certain consequences associated. So that's kind of the basis of that. And the last thing I really need to talk about is superstitious behavior, which kind of occurs due to conditioning. So it's, um, in a sense, it's, it's when people associate correlation with causation. So there's, for example, like people think, like there's a superstition that black cats are evil, which is caused by 
some unfortunate event happening and then at the same time there happens to be a black cat, but doesn't necessarily mean the black cats cause an, like, an unfortunate event. That's just coincidence, but people adopt that into a belief and then it becomes a superstition and people start believing those superstitions. And these superstitions get even more intense when people are under stress because they kind of create a sense of control rather than people taking accountability for their own actions or just just putting it to luck people like to feel in control by ass assigning it to um a stimulus like the black cat or a superstition in general and i think that's about it but if there's anything i needed to add i will add it um, to the slides when i update upload them and by the way apologies for not uploading the week four slides i will have the slides recording Kahoot all uploaded for weeks four and five by the end of this week. And on to the next topic, which I'll let the person share. So with Indigenous health, the first thing that you need to do is define someone's ATSI identity. Um, and there's three requirements that you need in order for a person to um, obtain Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander status. So the first is uh, self-identification as ATSI. The second is acceptance by their community. And the third is um, a proof of, lin of lineage. And something important to remember is that Indigenous identity does not correspond to a skin colour, but rather it's built into a community. Uh, so there's a large health gap between Indigenous Australians and other Australians across a number of indicators, um, which arose due to the accumulation of inequities over time. So some of the main ones that I think are like high yield for exams are the fact that they have a lower life expectancy um, and also a higher prevalence of strep A. So it's 0.01% um, in the non-Indigenous population versus 0.082% in Indigenous people. So you can see that that's more than eight times more likely. Um, and the significance of strep A is that it can eventually lead to rheumatic heart disease, which is also higher in Indigenous populations. Um, there's also higher rates of chronic diseases like diabetes, ischemic heart disease, asthma and end-stage kidney disease, as well as infectious diseases like TB, um, which is almost eradicated in um, non-Indigenous populations, um, and hepatitis B and C and pneumococcal disease. So there's a few different um, stages of history that um, you'll find find in your HKS guide um, that essentially explains the different steps of how the um, current health gap actually emerged, um, starting with displacement in 1770. So um, when Australia was colonised, they colonised it based on the doctrine of discovery which states that if a country's population is not Christian um, and it didn't demonstrate um, European civilised behaviour, then it could be colonised. So um, due to that reason, uh, there was no treaty that was entered into with Indigenous Australians. Um, so they were um, taken advantage of in many ways um, due to that lack of treaty. Uh, and the European settlers at that time also brought communicable diseases with them that weren't earlier present um, in Australia. So some examples include smallpox, tuberculosis, as well as STIs, which were transmitted through sexual violence um, against Indigenous women. There was also land theft um, of Indigenous land. So they were forced to um, leave their ancestral lands um, and that physical displacement not only made them lose their homes but also their food and water sources. Um, and there's also a lot of frontier violence and massacres at the time um, of the settlers arrival as well as the introduction of addictive substances like tobacco and alcohol. Uh, so following on from that, um, in 1837 uh, until 1937, there was a period of segregation. 
So after the frontier violence, there was a very small Indigenous population left and the settlers believed that they would die out soon. And so they um, sent the Indigenous people into state-sanctioned missions and reserves. So they lost their freedom of movement since these reserves were monitored um, uh, by state-sanctioned guards. Uh, and they also lost their freedom of labor and religion. Um, they lost custody of their children, um, control over their own property. Uh, they even lost their names because they were given Western names um, and they were forbidden from speaking their own language. Um, so by 1937, um, they had reached the third period, which was uh, forced assimilation. So when they realised that this population didn't really seem to be um, dying out as they had thought they would, um, they held um, an event called the Conference of Aboriginal Welfare in 1937. And the, the government decided to forcibly assimilate the remaining Indigenous Australians into the uh, non-Indigenous population. And this led to a policy called rooting out the Black which it, uh, essentially had the concept of diluting the amount of Indigenous blood by systematic introduction of white sexual partners. So the idea was that eventually, as the generations continued down, um, the percentage of Indigenous heritage would continue on decreasing um, as those people were kept being forced to have white um, partners. Uh, and this was also the time of the stolen generation, which is when Indigenous children were forcibly taken away from their biological parents um, and put into white families with the assumption that they would grow up um, with a Western name and Western habits and so on, and their behaviours would become similar to those of the European settlers. Um, and finally, in the 1960s, is when the Aboriginal health gap was actually recognised. Um, but even um, in the 1960s, it's important to note that um, they believed that that health gap was just due to genetic factors um, within Aboriginal people, and they didn't recognise the fact that the systemic violence that had been enacted against them was the actual reason for the health gap. Um, so cultural safety is um, the accumulation and application of knowledge of ATSI values, principles and norms in order to overcome cultural imbalances. And the way that you can create cultural safety is by providing training in Indigenous health to healthcare workers, having at least one Indigenous healthcare worker on the team, and engaging with family and community members to improve follow-up. And contrastingly, cultural blindness is when a health service does not consider cultural appropriateness when providing care. I'll just let the next person share screen. Okay, um, so hopefully you can see the screen. Um, so I'm gonna talk about ethical issues in doctor-patient relationships. Um, so basically, obviously, it's very important to recognise that there is an inherent power imbalance in a patient and doctor relationship. And so specifically about paternalism, paternalism is um, when, um, say, a doctor interferes with their patient's um, own wishes um, because the doctor is, con they have some sort of concern for the person's well-being and are doing what they deem best for the patient, um, but obviously we don't want to um, act in a paternalistic way with our patients. We want it very much to be a patient-centered approach with their own um, views and values being um, considered. So there are two types of paternalism, weak and strong. Weak is okay in some cases, such as um, if you're deciding what to do for a patient who can't um, make that decision for themselves, um, such as someone who um, is under the influence of drugs or something like that. Um, and then there's strong where you're overriding um, the decision of a patient who can capably make that decision, which is not okay. Um, 
the next slide. So therapeutic privilege. Um, so this is to do with um, being truthful and open with your patient. So obviously truth telling is really important, talking to the patient about um, what their treatment is going to be like and what the um, diagnosis is and things like that is really important so that the patient's able to make a fully informed decision, be um, autonomous and also have that trust in the medical profession. However, there are some cases where a doctor can choose to withhold information. Um, for example, if they think that disclosing certain bits of information might make the patient more stressed or might um, specifically in someone who is already unstable so that would be a decision that they may have to make um, and then so confidentiality versus privacy so privacy is a right um, and it's a right of all patients to prevent any unwanted access to their own bodies and any um, unwanted use of their personal information and confidentiality is the duty to respect that right of privacy um, and Again, there are situations where you might have to consider breaking confidentiality. And when you're doing this, you need to consider these three things. Um, the the um, consequence of that potential harm, um, the likelihood of something occurring. For example, if someone has been given a diagnosis of some sort of um, STD and they don't want to tell their partner, so um, in that sort of case, you have to think about the possibility of the harm of harm occurring to their partner and also the consequences to that patient for breaching confidentiality. So in that case, there obviously would be consequences to that patient. So that would be something to take into consideration. Um, and then just a last last thing is the difference between extrinsic value and intrinsic value. So this might be something that a patient might consider when they're making a decision. Um, so it, extrinsic value is based on um, some uh, a thing's purpose or what it can do for you. So, for example, shoes have an extrinsic value because they help us not get our feet dirty when we walk. Um, and then intrinsic value is something that can um, provide the moral justification for decisions that we make. For example, religion or values that our family has taught us um and things like that and i think yep yeah, that's the last slide so i'll stop sharing and let the next person share yep so i guess i'd like to um preface um my bit of the presentation by saying um the content i covered today i believe is quite important um to the life of, of a medical student and the life of a doctor i think um the profession like the medical profession within the profession sorry there is a lot of stress um, so I think it's really important um, to maybe consider some of the things I talk about today. Um, I, for one, when even going through these slides, was really thinking about, you know, my days, how present am I in the sort of decisions I make every day? Um, so yeah, I encourage everyone listening to maybe do the same. Okay, so getting into it. Um, so I'd like to also say a lot of the slides today are sort of just going to be full of information and writing. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and sort of pick on and um, talk about the information I believe is really important. Um, and then, yeah, really run through it as quick as possible um, to not get you bored. Okay, so anxiety versus stress. So anxiety, to put it simply, is worrying about a future event. Um, and Craig emphasizes that this response, this anxiety response that we have is often disproportionate, the level of threat um, of the future event. Um, then we have stress, which is a perceived inability to cope with current events. Um, for example, learning the metabolism of triacylglycerols. Um, and the interaction between an external stimulus, um, sorry, stress is the interaction between an external stimulus and an individual's reaction. Okay, so quickly, um, what are the effects of anxiety um, and stress? So most are quite sort of self-explanatory. Um, but yeah, just imagine all the things that can happen if a person becomes stressed or anxious. So the first is a flight or uh, fight or flight response, um, aka the acute stress response. Um, and this activates the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and what happens as a result of this, you might have sweaty palms um, and then a bit of a gag there. Um, and then you have your parasympathetic or your rest and digest sort of response. So it counteracts this um, when calm. Um, and I guess another thing to understand is that prolonged anxiety or stress um, can have damaging long-term effects through increased stress on the heart um, and increased metabolism. 
Um, this is termed allostatic load. Um, give me one second, guys. Oh, okay, just a message. Okay, thanks, Sav. Um, okay, so very quickly as well, some of the long-term effects of poor mental health include, um, so the symptoms are lethargy, headaches, sweatiness, depression, nausea. Um, some behavioral long-term effects are an, an unhealthy lifestyle, anger, poor concentration. Um, there are effects on immunity as well. Um, you might have you know, a greater susceptibility to infections and overactive inflammatory response might occur as well. Um, and then disease as well. You might have a greater sort of risk of um, disease. So, um, you know, poor mental health is an independent risk factor for many diseases, uh, including cancer and heart disease, um, as it affects genetic, and, and it affects genetic expression as well. It shortens uh, telomeres. Um, that's a bit of a gag um, in a lot of med sort of circles as well. Um, but yeah, pretty much the main sort of general gist that you should get from the slide is that there are many, there's a plethora of long-term effects of poor mental health, um, which is why we should really look after ourselves um, and be perceptive to when we might be feeling down, when we might be feeling a high. Um, so yeah. Um, and this is really interesting. I remember reading this before my end of year exam last year, and, and it was quite, quite interesting as well. So these effects of the long-term effects that we've gone through can be avoided by seeking um, eudaimonic well-being rather than hedonic well-being. Um, so eudaimonic well-being is pleasure derived from the meaning of life. Um, so let's let's sort of give a few examples, things like a fulfilling career, spending time with family, pursuing one's passion. Um, so they're all pleasures that can be derived from, um, from meaning in life. Um, and so I guess the, the main thing is um, we should sort of seek uh, eudaimonic well-being um, and if you contrast that with um, hedonic well-being it's things like immediate pleasure or immediate um, gratification um, and that's things like maybe gaming for a bunch of hours um, eating um, your favorite food which might be unhealthy or things like stress as well, uh, sorry sex as well uh, and then we have mindfulness so um this might be sort of treading on um, Yufei's toes a little. So Yufei, let me know. Um, are you, do you cover this in any sort of extent? Uh, it's okay. Um, you can cover this. It looks like our country okay. is quite similar like in terms of mindfulness, but that's all right. I yeah. have other things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Yufei will probably give you a much better run through of mindfulness, but I'll give it a shot. Um, so... Yeah, I guess what I was sort of talking about, mindfulness is um, a discipline in which one can train the attitude and attention so that they may be more present in their day-to-day -day activities. Um, so in really simple terms, avoiding being on autopilot. Um, there was a really good example that I sort of thought about, um, like a really simple form of mindfulness could be sort of just making an con a conscious effort to listen to the sounds of cars um, on the road whilst you're walking um, on the footpath. Um, personally, I, I believe like sometimes when I'm just walking, I can be an autopilot. I can completely tune out sort of the voices of people, the sounds of cars, the sounds of birds, all of that. I think mindfulness is all about really sort of interacting with our surroundings, making sure we're in the present. Um, so yeah, and, and that can really lead to a more um, attentive brain and make your experiences richer and your perceptions more accurate, which is what we all sort of want. Um, and then very quickly as well, just to shoot through some slides, we have complex versus simple, simple multitasking. Um, so multitasking is a, a misnomer. So um, it's um, pretty much like a facade. You can't actually focus on two complex tasks at once um, because your attention rapidly switches between the two. Um, a good example would be talking on the phone and driving. Um, so, yeah, um, there is no such thing as sort of multitasking on two complex tasks at once. Um, whereas you have things like simple multitasking where you can attempt to um, concentrate on one complex and one simple task at the same time. A good example would be listening to music like a Spotify playlist um, whilst drawing, um, which I'm sure we've all probably done at one point. Um, so yeah, and then there's a few disorders of attention um, that I'll quickly run through. We have attention deficit trait, um, which is difficulty maintaining attention um, and difficulty with organization and time management as well, um, leads to a constant level of panic and guilt. And then we have depression, 
which is your brain is constantly in default mode, leading to um, a lot of rumination, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. Um, so focus is really not in the present. So, um, I think Yash covered the um, topic of mindfulness really well. And the most important thing I could add to this um, presentation would just be the memes. I love the cat memes. Um, <laughs> basically, just want to preface this by saying uh, mindfulness could be really helpful for some, uh, like practicing mindfulness could be really helpful um, for um, some people. Um, and yeah, like I'm just hoping that this presentation could help you a bit with your, um, I don't know, mindfulness practice. Uh, and just a fun fact, human attention span is now actually um, less than the attention span of a goldfish apparently, according to research. So like the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds while human is eight seconds. I don't know how goldfish has an attention span, but all right, I guess we can move on. Um, yeah, so just um, let's start with what is mindfulness. So basically being mindful involves um, your attention and your attitude. So your attention um, has three aspects. So one is knowing where your attention is. Um, secondly, prioritize where the attention needs to be. And thirdly, for the attention to go where, go to like where it needs to be and stay there. And mindful attitude involves openness, curiosity, acceptance, and self-compassion. Moving on. Yeah, so we already mentioned this um, in previous topics, but um, just extend, expanding a bit on the default brain versus the attentive brain. So in the brain's default state, um, the mind is inattentive. So it's kind of um, rendering everywhere. Um, so the default brain is associated with stress, anxiety, depression, um, al even Alzheimer's disease. So this is not to say that um, having your, being inattentive or like having your mind on one that is not good. It's just saying that if you're never, um, paying attention or like your mind is never focused, then um, that might be associated with some negative outcome. And the attentive brain, so when you're in a state of flow and when you're focusing on something, your brain is efficient and quiet. And just a bit about um, multitasking as well. So um, yeah, multitasking is a myth. And basically um, it's when we are switching back and forth between tasks really fast and that creates the illusion of um, where doing two things at the same time, but actually that is very difficult, especially if the two things are both um, complex tasks. Okay, moving on. So why practice mindfulness? So why should we kind of consider um, practicing mindfulness? So research shows that mindfulness-based intervention improves uh, physical health, improves memory, um, even test performance, mood, self-esteem, and the list goes on. Um, moving on to the next slide. So to practice mindfulness, um, there are basically different ways to do it. So you could do formal mindfulness sessions, for example, to sit down and meditate and um, yeah, basically spending the time to just um, dedicate it to mindfulness practice. It could also be informal practice. Um, just being mindful in everyday activities. For example, I really like Yash, uh, Yash, Yash's, um, um, Yash's example of kind of um, just when you're um, walking on the street and like listening to the sound of cars or listening to like what is going on around you. Um, yeah, just like things like that and kind of trying to focus on, on your, your focus on the present. And the third one is cognitive practices. So that could be basically, um, it is implicit in both formal and informal practices. And that uh, the big kind of the, the four aspects of cognitive practice are perception, um, letting go. So like not being attached to like any one thing, um, acceptance and presence. Okay, next slide. Um, so this slide is just showing uh, another important con concept that's covered in this lecture. So that's the, um, not too sure how to pronounce this, um, 
Yeah, but basically that's the stress performance curve. And this curve shows that um, actually a certain level of stress, like sometimes we, may, we say stress as if it's like a, a negative thing. So like no one wants to be stressed, but actually a certain level of stress could be beneficial for our performance. So um, that is called eustress. So being in a state of eustress um, actually leads to an optimal performance. So um, which means that if you don't have any stress, like um, you don't have any pressure to do anything at all, that's um, actually could lead someone to be bored or um, not being very productive. Um, and having a little bit of stress um, and a little bit of pressure there could actually kind of just push us into this uh, into the state of kind of um, optimal performance. But like having too much stress um, usually would lead to fatigue, exhaustion. And um, yeah, it's just like, um, stress is not necessarily a bad thing, but like having too much of it is probably not good. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, so this is a, a model that's based on mindfulness. So what is different about this model is that uh, you might remember from our, our last slide that um, basically your performance is optimal when you have a, a certain level of stress. Um, but this mind, this model, uh, which is based on mindfulness, and um, it basically shows that when you are mindful of what you're doing and you actually put all your attention into this one task, um, your performance is actually highest. Um, you could achieve a very high performance without having that stress, which is kind of what we desire. Because in the end, like we still don't want to, don't want to be stressed. So um, being mindful. Uh, could lead us to to this uh, highest performance without um, so like being relaxed and so like this highest performance that we're being relaxed but um, we're still fully aware and engaged in our activity. Okay, I believe that is the uh, the last slide, and yeah, thank you for sticking around and thank you for listening to our presentation and good luck for your mid-term break. Not good luck. Um, congrats. Congrats for getting so far and yeah. Congrats.